guys. But I'm sure you're all watching the videos very carefully. But um, so today we're going to do Mark Up Cane. And um, I just ate some Halloween candy. It was a very good, um, what was the name called? Butterfinger um, candy bar. But um, today uh, we're doing um, Mark Up Cane. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, unfortunately, on Monday and Wednesday, I'm going to be gone again. I really feel bad about this. I warned you that I travel a lot. I don't know how to, what else to do about it, but um, you guys just can use this time to you know, read the material, do the lab. Um, you pretty much know what you need to do at this point, right? Are there any questions? On on the lab, the material or anything? Are people getting it? Okay, with this I'm going to um, go to the document camera. So no class on Monday and Wednesday. Okay. Okay, um, so here's Marco model. Um, I'm not here to Marco, Marco change, okay? So what's the Markov chain? So, um, so with the Markov chain, the idea is that uh, okay. So, um, so in a Markov chain, you say well the probability distribution of x n equals some state j, given that uh, x k for all the paths for a k less than that this is only going to be a, a, a function of um, the previous value. Okay. So the, the, the distribution of the next state, given all the previous days, is really on, only dependent upon the previous day. Now, does that mean so, so you can draw it like this? So you have a sequence of states, okay? Maybe I should have written the XNs first and then put the circles around them. Actually, you know, it's easy, but the circles are kind of floppy. So um, XN, XN plus 1, XN plus 2, and then the half we have XN minus 1, and X minus 2. I draw a circle around each one of these, these states. That's sort of standard visual notation. And then draw arrows. The arrows represent conditional probability. So Xn is really, given all the past, is really only dependent on the previous one. Now, one sort of trick question that comes up a lot is, is Xn independent of Xn minus 2? Are they, are they dependent? Are they correlated, say? Are they, are they or are they independent? So is Xn independent of the state two X is two um, um, state previous? No, it's not. It's conditionally independent. So if I know Xn minus one, then I can throw away Xn minus two. But it's not independent. So the classic example of this would be like a random walk. So in a random walk. Uh, you have something like this. And this is sort of drawing. Okay? So if you know the values, if you if you consider the value at some point, right? And you say, well, is that if I if I know the value at some previous point, say here, then uh, it's independent of all the paths given that point, right? But it's but this point here is not independent of previous points. Those are correlated. If I know that's large, then that's large. It's likely to be large. In fact, for a random walk, the conditional expectation of any future point given the current is equal to the current. Right? So the mean value 
from this point forward is equal to the current value. So there, there's definitely any two points on this curve are dependent, but given a whole, given the entire path, I only know, need to know the most recent point. Okay. So that's the concept of a Markov chain, and in, it, it doesn't have to be a scalar value. X can be a state. Okay. So well, okay, we're gonna if it's a Markov chain. Terminology. If it's a Markov chain, is that X n is a member of some set omega, and omega is discrete. So by discrete, I mean it has a countable number of elements in it. So without loss of generality, I can just take this to be is it zero through m minus one, the so m discrete state. I mean. They could be other things, but it really doesn't matter. You can just call them zero through n minus one, and then make it simple. It could also, and n here could be infinity, so it could be the set zero through infinity. Um, so, okay, with infinity not inclusive, so. Um, it could be, well, maybe there's no way to drop. I mean, it's just it's three dots, and drops, and infinity is not included in that. So, so that's a, that's a countable, countably infinite number of elements. That's the thing from the uncountable set, like the real number. Um, okay, so a Markov chain implies that the state is discrete. Uh, and it also implies that. Uh, n is, is a uh, uh, a counting number. Um, is uh, we, uh, I, I forget the term. Okay, so these are all positive and negative integers. Okay, uh, I think they're called counting numbers or natural numbers. Uh, I should know this, but anyway, so that's the Markov chain, a Markov process. The Markov process is. Uh, um, let me make sure I get the terminology here. This is uh, so you, you can have a. Um, okay, the Markov a discrete time Markov process. Markov process um, means that. Xn would say be a member of say R and be a continuous state in an end of the degree. We won't really consider that. We're only going to consider a uh, Markov chain where both the, the, the independent and dependent parameter of process are, are discrete. So the state degree and time degree. And uh, yeah, and then there's a continuous time Markov process. There's actually a continuous time uh, Markov process. So you can have it continuous in time. You get x of t, where x is a member of omega, and um, omega is discrete. And then you can actually have it where it's it's continuous, uh, so you can have it be discrete, or you can also have it be continuous. I mean, we're not going to consider those cases. The only case we're going to consider is the Markov chain, where it's discrete in time and space, because that basically is the simplest case. When everything is discrete, it's easier to deal with, because you can have probability uh, mass functions instead of probability uh, density. Okay. Um, so okay, um, uh, so that's what a Markov chain is, and uh, um, okay. Now um, the idea then is you can parameterize the Markov chain. So uh, by saying okay, first you 
you look at the probability of the initial state, so you say X, um, uh, okay, so at any state at any particular time, so Xn, the probability of that is equal to J, you define that as being um, pi sub J of N. So this is the probability that uh, at time n, the state takes on a uh, state uh, j, right? And then the sum over j, a member of omega of pi j of n has to equal 1, because the probability has to sum to 1, right? And I can also say then the probability that um, xn equals j, given that x n minus 1 is equal to i, that's going to be defined as uh, p i j n. So that's the, pro the so-called transition probability. And the sum over i, member of omega, of p i j n, that also has to be equal to 1. Right? Because you have to go to some sort of space. Uh, the sum of the probabilities of all the possible transitions has to sum to 1. Okay. So, it's easy enough to show then that the joint probability of, say, xn equals j and xn minus 1 uh, equals i that that's going to be equal to pij of n times pi n minus 1 of j. So the probability, the joint probability of the sequence of x being equal to i and then being equal to j is the probability that you start in, uh, oops, it's supposed to be an i. It's the probability you start in state i and then from state i, you go to state j. Simple enough. Okay. Now, um, then the probability of the probability of state xn equal to j, that's going to be uh, xn j, right? That has to be equal to then. Uh, the probability that xn equals j and xn minus 1 equals i summed over i. So that's going to be equal to pij ii n minus 1 and summed over i. Right? So in matrix notation, if I write out, if I say pi n here is a, is, a, um, oops, is a row vector, and probability, in Markov chains for some reason, they use row vectors for probabilities, this is by convention. So if this is a row vector, and it's going to be pi n 0 through pi n, and this is n minus 1. So the row vector containing the probability of each possible state at time n, right? And then I write a matrix here, pij at time n. I'm going to drop the, the n because the n's are kind of a mess, okay? Uh, it just makes it kind of ugly. Then this is p, um, uh, zero, zero, and this is P one zero T M minus one zero. So basically this is um, okay, this is the probability that you enter into state zero given that you started in state zero. This is the probability that you enter into state zero given that you started in state one. You can tell if this matrix is going to be T n minus 1, n minus 1, and this is T 0, n minus 1. So then you can see that using matrix notation, pi n times P n 
where now this is a row vector, this is a, a matrix that is n by n, that's going to be equal to, oh, I'm sorry, this is going to be minus 1. This is going to be equal to pi n. So let me break that again. So pi n is equal to So we have pi n minus 1 times p n is going to be equal to pi n. So the new probability is the old probability times the transition matrix. Now if, uh, if this is dependent on n, uh, this is called a uh, non-homogeneous Markov chain. Okay. This is a non-homogeneous Markov chain because the transition probabilities are a function of n. Now, this is kind of closely related to the idea of a stationary random process, right? A stationary random process is a random process where the distribution of the random process is not a function of time, right? That if I shift the signal in time, its distribution remains the same, okay? So, um, this thing's related, but it's different. The reason it's different is that just because a random process is non homogeneous, okay, so homogeneous, a homogeneous Markov chain means that uh, Pn is just equal to P, is not a function of N. So the transition probabilities are not a function of N. So the question is, is a homogeneous Markov chain stationary? Is a homogeneous Markov chain stationary? Does anyone of the three panelists in the audience want to venture a guess? <laughs> God, I have to show the class. It's too depressing for me, okay? Uh, I'm going to be lecturing to an empty room, okay? And then you guys are just going to be in cyberspace, okay? But I, I live in the physical world. Um, so, uh, in Okay, is a homogeneous Markov chain necessarily stationary? I see somebody saying no. Why? Uh, well, if it's like a random walk, you can just walk off over time. And well, that would be one way in which it's not stationary. That's a very good point. Can you give another example, maybe? I was actually thinking of another one, but that's a perfectly good one. So I'm thinking of another one. Uh, let's say there's only two states, okay? So, uh, okay, so there's, um, so I guess you could end up stuck in one space if you have high transition probability. To yeah, in fact, it doesn't even have to be that complicated because let's say that, um, in fact, uh, what we'll do is, I think here, okay, um, let's consider this example I have. Uh, okay, uh, uh, let, me, let me consider this example. And um, so let's say we have the following transition matrix. And it's got uh, the value, um, okay, so given you start a state, you stay in that state. Oh, I'm trying to make sure I have this notation correct. Uh, okay, so you have, uh, okay, so this is one minus row. Oh, by the way, this matrix has that two properties. The Tij has to be greater than or equal to zero for all i and j, right? And the sum over um, j of Tij has got to be one, right? So in other words, you start in some state then you have to go somewhere. So the probability of you going 
So all the different places you might go have to sum the one. Right. Okay. So if if the matrix has these properties, it's called a Markov matrix, and then pretty much it represents consistently a, 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 the distribution of a Markov chain. Okay. So let's consider this. Here it has the properties. Let's say that um, uh, row here is greater than zero and it's less greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. Okay? That's the constraint, right? So um, it the row is on the one. So and each entry is greater than or equal to zero, so you're good. Okay? Now what does this represent? This represents, so row here represents the probability that you're going to change state. So if row is very, very small, it'll stay in the same state for a long time. Okay? So now, here, this is a homogeneous Markov chain, right? This is homogeneous. Oh. Homogeneous. It's a homogeneous state, okay? But um, it's not necessarily stationary. Because let's say that we know that x0 is equal to 0, okay? That implies that, the, that pi 0 of 0 equals 1, and pi 0 of, and pi 1, or pi 0 of 1, of, of 1 is equal, or pi sub 1 superscript 0 is 0, right? The probability of being in state Zero, uh, at, at state one at time zero is zero, and the probability of being in state zero at time zero is one. Right now, is that going to be stationary? Well, not really, because if I plot this, I start off in state, and and let's say row here is very small. It's much less than one, and it's greater than zero. Okay. So I'm going to stay in this state for a long time until suddenly I'm going to change state and I'm going to stay in that state for a long time, right? So it's not stationary because if it was stationary, its distribution would not be a function of time. So in other words, there's a transient behavior that you can't ignore. And because of the transient behavior, it's not stationary even though it's homogeneous. You also gave an example where even if, if the transient, it's even worse than this because your example is actually better than one. Because you, no matter how long you wait, your example of the random walk is never going to be stationary. And um, it'll never, it'll be remain transient forever. Okay, but electrical engineers, by the nature, um, believe in transient behavior and stationary behavior because electrical engineers were trained in the, in the world where you had like a circuit, okay? And you put like some input in the circuit and you wait for the circuit to settle down. So we, all electrical engineers believe that all um, random, that all systems, if you drive them with some input, will eventually become stationary, okay? So for electrical engineers, it's in the DNA that they believe that all Markov chains are, or will eventually become the transient signal will drop, die down, right? Computer scientists all believe that every Markov chain is um, not stationary, okay? Because they believe that every Markov chain eventually reaches a terminal state and stops changing, okay? okay. Every behavior is transient. So a computer scientist, every interesting behavior is transient. And so as an electrical engineer, every interesting behavior is stationary, okay? That is why electrical engineers and computer scientists fundamentally are like from Mars and Venus, okay? Because why? Because computer scientists write programs, okay? And when you write a program, you're totally not interested in the thing reaching a steady state. When you're interested in a program is a final, is a, is a, like a Markov chain, okay? And uh, because each new state depends upon the previous state, like a computer is a state machine, right? But you're totally interested in the transient behavior, right? You're not interested in like the steady state behavior of, of the computer. You're interested in this transient behavior where you get the answer, okay? 
So, um, so there's two very different ways of looking at the world, right? But uh, if you're an electrical engineer and you look at the Markov chain, you say, well, I'll run the Markov chain long enough until it reaches steady state. And once it reaches steady state, then it should be a stationary distribution. If it's a homogeneous Markov chain and I run it long enough, I believe that the transient will, because I'm an electrical engineer, I believe that the, the transient behavior will die away and will reach steady state. So that is one of the primary things we're going to talk about in this section. We're going to talk about the steady state behavior on Markov chain. And in that case, when they reach a steady state, okay, which they don't always, if they reach a steady state, we say that the Markov chain is ergodic. Actually, the definite, a Markov chain is ergodic if it reaches the steady state. And I'll give that a more precise definition later, right? So if the transient behavior is five down. So, uh, but it's usually got to be a homogeneous Markov chain, although we're going to consider some non-homogeneous Markov chain. And uh, let me switch to the PC here, because um, is it? Yeah, I want to show you this. Okay, so here's a in the notes. Here's an example of a. Uh, let's see. It's an example of a. Uh, a Markov chain generated with when p when that row factor is very small, then it stays in the same state for a long time and then it switches. When the row factor is 0.5, then each new state has a 50-50 chance of of, uh, of changing. So in that case, basically, it's like each new sample is completely independent. And when rho is a very large number like 0.9, okay, or maybe I should have made it 0.09. What happens is it almost always switches. Once in a while, it doesn't. So the interesting thing is the small probability of not switching sometimes. And those are like little heat cups where the phase shifts. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, okay. Now uh, okay. Now the probability of a sequence then is going to be the probability. So if tau Tau sub j is the probability of the state at time zero, it's the initial probability. And then for a homogeneous Markov chain, you can just multiply by the sequence of transition probabilities, and that gives you the probability of the sequence of the Markov chain. So let me sort of illustrate that. Um, So uh, let's see, dot camera. So coming back to this diagram with the x's, the states, and the little circles, the probability of this sequence is the probability of the first state. So let me draw with this. So you have x zero, and you have x one, and you have x two, and you have x three, x four, right? So if you want to calculate the probability of the sequence. Well, first you calculate the probability of um, x0, which I'm calling tau sub x0, right? Then you calculate the probability of this first transition, which is p of x0, x1. It's the probability of going from x0 to x1. And then this is p of x1, x2. And this is p of x2, x3. And this is P of x3, x4. Right. So you multiply those all together. Zero and minus one of P of x and x and plus one. I did it a little bit differently in, in the notes. And then that's the probability of the whole sequence. And why do we care about writing down the probability of the whole sequence? Because if we want to do things like estimate the maximum likely estimator of the of the Markov chain, we need to be able to write down the probability distribution so we can estimate that. Okay? So what are the parameters of the Markov chain? The parameters of the Markov chain are this tau oops. The parameters of the Markov chain are going to be tau of n or tau of i, I'll say. And it's P of IJ, so this is going to be the parameter. And of course, 
it's these things for I and J uh, members of Oh, I'm sorry. Members of Omega. Even know those. So if you know tau, the initial probabilities, and you know Tij, the transition probabilities, then you know everything about the distribution of the Markov chain. Right? Now what you can do is you can define um, you can define the following thing. You can say, okay, I'll take uh, K I J is going to be the number of times I went from state I to J. So I'll sum from N equals zero to N minus one. I'll take a delta function, because the delta function counts things, and I'll take delta of uh, X and um, uh, equals i and x n plus 1 equals j. So that counts the number of times I went from state i to j. This is a statistic, right, because it's a function of the random process. And I can also count I'll take, um, that's my notation here. Uh, N, I'm N sub J is equal to uh, just delta of X zero minus J. So this seems kind of still a notation, but it's useful. So I just count N here for each J is equal to zero or one. There's a reason I write it this way, because if you count, it's going to turn out that these statistics work out as being the natural sufficient statistics of the exponential distribution. The Markov chain has an exponential distribution, and these are the natural sufficient statistics. So this is sort of the natural coordinate system, you might say, to do calculations and maximum likely estimates. It's going to come out more simply if you, if you take the statistics in this form. See, this is the uh, the probability of the sequence, but it's hard to work with in this one. It's going to be easier to work with if we were in terms of these natural sufficient statistics. And by the way, later in this section, we're going to talk about hidden Markov models. And the way you train hidden Markov models is using the EM algorithm. So we're going to want to apply the EM algorithm. And remember what we learned from the last section of the EM algorithm that you want to put everything in exponential distribution as natural sufficient statistics because then it's really easy to write the update equations up down, okay? Is, is, is this making sense? Is everybody following this? Okay, so, so these are sufficient statistics, okay? So since they're sufficient statistics, I should be able to write down the probability distribution in terms of the sufficient statistics. Well, what's it going to be? Well, uh, what I do is I take uh, P I J, right, and I raise that to the power K I J, because that's how many times I'm going to multiply by P I J. And then I take the product of this over I and J. Now, I also have to multiply by um, uh, the uh, initial probability. So for that, um, what I'm going to do is I'll take uh, I'll take uh, uh, I'll take that and I'll multiply it by uh, uh, tau i to the or tau j, I guess, to the nj, and then take the part of this over j. Now, you say, well, this seems like a complicated way of writing down the distribution. But, okay, but first of all, you see why this is true. Because, uh, um, so if n is 0, then tau to the 0 is just 1, by convention. And then uh, the only, all this is a very complicated way of writing down 
the tau associated with the one value that actually occurred at time zero. And then these are, this is, you just take the transition probability and you raise it to that power because that's how many times that transition occurred. So you're just counting the number of transitions and for each transition, you, you take the probability of that transition raised to that power of the number of times it occurred, okay? Does this make sense or not? Yes. Okay. So if I take the log of this, I get now the product term in the sum. So I get the sum over i and j of k i j times the log of p i j plus the sum over j of uh, n j times the log of tau j. But this is the beauty. When you see it in this form, you can see it's an exponential distribution. Why is it an exponential distribution? Because it's the inner product of the statistic with some function of the parameters. So the log of the p's and the log of the tau, those are a function of the parameters. And the n and the k are the statistics. And it's a linear, it's a multiplied human. You're, you're multiplying terms and summing them. So that's an inner product. That can be represented as represented as inner product. You can see this is an exponential dis distribution. And if you work through and solve for the maximum likelihood estimate, what do you think the maximum likelihood estimate is going to be? Well, it's going to be, uh, just from a notational point of view, the maximum likelihood estimate will be, I'll, I'll denote by tau hat and p hat ij. So what's the maximum likelihood estimate going to be? I mean, just guess. I mean, it's the only logical thing. K i j by sigma k i j. Say that again. K i j divided by sigma k i j. All right. So let's see. So it's going to be uh, right. So it's going to be p hat i j is going to be k i j divided by one. The summation of. Uh, the drive by the sum, so this has to be a probability distribution, right? So it's going to be the sum over j of k i j. And then that guarantees the probability distribution, right? That could be the maximum likely estimate. Because the only logical thing to do, and the logical estimate of, of the rate of transition is the observed rate of transition, right? So this is the probability that given that you start in state i, so you're going to go to state j. And then tau hat j, that's going to be equal to uh, nj over, well, it's kind of silly, the sum over j of nj, but that's just going to hold you one, but okay. All right. And then that's going to be the maximum likelihood estimate. But you can actually derive it. I mean, don't just take my word for it. You can do the constraint optimization problem here. What's the constraint? The constraint is that the sum over j of pij has to be 1, and the sum over j of tau j has to be 1. So that's the, the constraint optimization. And um, let's see. Um, uh, okay, so those are the maximum likelihood estimators. Uh, so there's, okay, right, um, and that's pretty much it. Um, let me see, I'm wondering if this is the problem. Oh, yeah, okay, now, now, um, right, so are there any questions about Mark Obtain then? Uh, any questions? So the next thing, uh, I'm going for getting ahead, but maybe that's not a bad thing because I am traveling a lot. Um, uh, okay, so now we have this concept of a hidden Markov model. So that's uh, figure 9.2 in the notes. Let me just put that up so I can try to draw it. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, let's just go back. Yeah, these are the equations I just wrote down. And miraculously, they're, the, what I wrote on the paper was, was correct, right? I mean, the, the equations 9.3 and 9.4 are exactly what I wrote down in the paper. Okay, now, now, next we're going to talk about hidden Markov models. So, what are you going to use these Markov chains for? Well, we're going to use these as models, but they're discrete models, right? So, 
Um, one thing that's very useful is this kind of, well, okay, this idea of a hidden Markov model. So um, it's like, uh, okay, so we had this idea of a Gaussian mixture where uh, we had a state X and then the state was discrete. It could take on n different values and depending upon which of the n values was, there was a different Gaussian distribution that we observed. So it was like you flip a n-sided coin, okay, then depending upon what outcome you got, then you generated a random variable, a Gaussian random variable with a different mean and variance, okay? So the overall distribution is not Gaussian, okay? Now, that's fine. Uh, your observations then are independent because what will happen is that each new state you generated with a new coin flip. But what if instead uh, the, the underlying state was correlated in time? So I like to give silly examples like a washing machine, okay? That is um, got some kind of circuit in it that can be in two states. If it's one state, it, it's uh, it's broken and it's noisy, okay? And the other state is uh, not broken and it's not noisy. So, but once it gets into the broken state, it stays there for a while. And then it randomly flips back at some point, okay? So, you have correlation in the underlying state and time. And then depending upon which state you're in, you get a different uh, observation in, in what could be this multivariate Gaussian distribution. In fact, it doesn't have to be Gaussian. It could be something else. It could be like Poisson or anything else you want. But this is called, a, in this general structure where the state is hidden, because I don't observe the state directly, I only observe the y, the actual Gaussian random variables, and then I, I indirectly can infer the state from my observations of the y, but the states are correlated in time. So this thing, X is a Markov chain, but I don't observe the Markov chain directly. Instead, I observe something that the Markov chain affects, which is the distribution of the Y, the multivariate uh, uh, vector Y. So uh, this is called a hidden Markov model. It's called a hidden Markov model because it's Markov chain, but the Markov chain is hidden. So it's a hidden Markov chain model, I guess. All right. So you you should read this section very carefully. Um, okay. So here we just have that the, the conditional distribution of the y given the x is set is something. Let's say it's multivariate Gaussian. Okay. And then um, each of the x's has is a Markov chain. So the joint distribution of the whole observation the x and the y together is at the top of page 189 and it has the form of this sum, okay? So the log is distribution is below it. Okay, now the challenge of a Markov chain is there's a few challenges to um, to, um, to uh, solving problems with hidden Markov models. Okay, and, and maybe I'll switch back to the document camera here. So we have a Markov, hidden Markov model, HMM, common abbreviation, okay? So we have X0, and then we have X1, X2, X3, and then for each of these, we have Y1, Y2, Y3, like this, okay? Now, typically what happens is that uh, Y is the observed data, X is unobserved. So this is just like in the, in the Gaussian mixture, you didn't know the underlying state. You didn't know if the, um, if the uh, plants were fertilized or unfertilized. So the question is, and then the parameter theta is the set of um, tau, uh, tau J 
and P I J for I and J a member of omega. So that's the set of parameters. But oh it's not just that. And then there might be parameters associated with the distribution of Y. So uh uh hold on. Uh, it, yeah, exactly. Uh, so there might be additional distributional parameters. I want to make sure my notation is consistent. Well, um, okay, let's call it C. So these could be related by C. Okay, and then this is P. Transitions between the axes is controlled by P. And then this first transition is, 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 is controlled by tau. Okay? So the parameters then are uh, really tau, j, p, i, j. And we'll call this c, i. And then you have to know these for i and j. Okay. So what are the problems that you have to solve here? Okay. There's a few different problems. Okay, one is called, uh, let me see. Um, let me make sure I use the terminology I use in the notes. Just a moment. So there's three things you want to do. You, you want to first do uh, state. estimation, the objective is that uh, given y, determine, I'll uh, put your estimate, x, but also given y and the parameters beta, you want to estimate x. Okay. So somebody tells you Theta, theta is the model, and they give you the observations of y, and then you have to determine x. That's state sequence estimation. Okay. Another thing you might want to do is, um, uh, hold on, I'm going to make sure I'm consistent with how I did this here. Uh, you might want to calculate uh, state probability uh, we'll call it calculation. So what here you want to do is you want to calculate given y and theta, you want to determine the probability of x given y and theta, okay? And then the other thing you might want to do is um, training. Training. So in training, you want to determine, so you given y, you want to determine theta hat. So, Hidden Markle model is sort of like um, a generic framework. It's a general model. But it has a lot of parameters. And now you have to fit the parameters to real data. So you say, I'm going to use a Hidden Markle model to, to model speech. I'm going to use a Hidden Markle model to model some noise coming out of a refrigerator, okay? The first thing I have to do, I have to estimate the parameters of the model so I can use it. This is called um, training, and it's done with the, with the, uh, with the Baum-Welch algorithm, okay? If I have observations and I have already trained the model, I want to be able to estimate the state sometime. That's useful. That would be like decoding, maximum likelihood to estimate decoding, the Turby algorithm for, for decoding. And if I want to estimate, and then if I have y and theta, 
I want to estimate the probabilities of the x's. Sometimes that is going to be very important for doing the training. Okay? So these are solve the problem. Okay, we're out of time. Goodbye. Okay. All right.